morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our first Science Cafe of the fall season. Uh, this is actually the fifth year of the Science Cafe series, the second year of the virtual um, alternative uh, series. Today we have rapid evolution in bats fighting a catastrophic disease. Uh, my name is Brian McGonigal. I am the manager of alumni and community engagement at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences and the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Uh, just a few things to go over before we get started. Uh, audience videos and microphones are muted for the duration of the event. The event is recorded and it will be posted subsequently online and shared in a follow-up email. Uh, you can submit your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen whenever you like. Uh, we will answer them in turn as time allows. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Mary Nucci. She is the Assistant Research Professor of Human Ecology and the Assistant Dean for Campus Engagement. She is the Director of our Science Cafe series. Mary, go ahead. Thank you, Brian, and welcome everybody to, as Brian said, our fifth year of Science Cafes. And I'm very honored to introduce Dr. Brooke Maslow. Dr. Maslow is an Associate Professor in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Natural Resources here at Rutgers. She has an undergraduate degree in biological resource engineering from University of Maryland and a PhD in ecology and evolution from Rutgers. Her research centers on an understanding the evolutionary behavioral and physiological mechanisms underpinning the ability of wild populations to persist in the face of significant environmental change, such as novel pathogens, which we're going to hear about today. Her work contributes to our understanding of basic science. However, she strongly believes in the value of effectively translating scientific research into practical evidence-based directives to equip stakeholders with appropriate decisions, support tools to advance conservation and sustainability objectives. In addition to her work on bats that she's going to talk about today, she co-leads an international collaborative network of research, researchers focused on sandy beach ecosystems and contributes mightily to climate resistance here in New Jersey by preparing and implementing landscape adaptation strategies in flood prone developed areas. Finally, Dr. Maslow is the director of the Rutgers Cooperative Extension Wildlife Conservation and Management Program, which I just learned about today and which is very fascinating. This program provides extensive services and outreach programs aimed at reducing human wildlife conflict in New Jersey and beyond. Dr. Maslow, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We look forward to your talk. Thanks, Mary, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Brian, also for the invitation. Uh, so I guess I will share my screen here. Give me a second. Okay, can everyone see that? Hope so, okay. Um, yeah, so when you, when you come to a public lecture about bats, you know, you probably have an image in your mind that's um, similar to one of these. Uh, you know, we're close to Halloween, so you probably think of Halloween decorations with bats and ghosts and jack-o'-lanterns. Uh, if you're a movie buff, maybe the bat, the Batman or the bat signal comes to your brain, or uh, you know, maybe some some images of, of bats being conjured up by Dracula. Uh, if you're sort of old school, you know, maybe you like Vincent Price and one of the older, you know, bat movies. Um, Maybe you're worried about interactions with bats, negative interactions with bats. You know, do they really get caught in your hair? Um, the answer is, you know, anything's possible, but generally they know exactly where they're going and they, they tend to avoid humans as much as they, they possibly can. Um, you know, and probably the most classic association we have negatively anyway with, with bats is, uh, is with rabies, right? Um, rabies is a fatal disease and yes, bats do carry rabies, uh, just like every other mammal, uh, just like raccoons and, and dogs and foxes and other things. Um, but basically, you know, less than 1% of all bats that are submitted to rabies labs test positive. Uh, so it's actually, the prevalence is, is quite low, um, which is contrary to, to popular opinion. In the COVID-19 era, I think I would be remiss uh, not to mention the association of bats with uh, several infamous global diseases, uh, things like Ebola and MERS and SARS-1, and now, of course, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and yes, it's true that bats are reservoirs for emerging viruses. And in fact, 
they can be classified or they have been classified as, as special viruses, um, a special, I'm sorry, special reservoirs for viruses. And, and why is that? Um, it's basically because bats can, can carry a significant viral load without getting sick. Um, and, and, and really the reason that that's possible for bats, um, unlike other animals uh, in the world is because bats really are what we consider physiological anomalies. You know, um, bats are the only flying mammals, right? Um, and so they really do defy gravity. Uh, mammals are not really supposed to fly. Uh, they're, they're heavy, um, and the amount of, of metabolic uh, stress that they put on their body in order to, to overcome those, those obstacles associated with flight really um, is, is a phenomenon. Um, and so in order for them to, to be able to overcome things like oxidative stress uh, and other such factors, they had to evolve a way to basically um, rapidly repair the, the damage to their own cells um, that they incur by having uh, pronounced flight and high metabolic rates. And so when they do that, and it's a complicated process, but essentially the bottom line is that while they're repairing their own cellular pathways, they're also somewhat inadvertently, or at least the hypothesis goes, somewhat inadvertently um, getting rid of or destroying viral cells. And so, so viruses can live in the body, but they can't um, live or the, the, the cells don't live long enough in order to um, allow them to get sick and then, and then to die. When I think of bats, though, um, I do think of those things, but this, these are more of the sorts of images that, that come to my mind. Um, I think about the incredible diversity of bats. You know, worldwide, we have over 1,200 species of bats, and they're just in all different shapes and colors and sizes. You know, um, here, if I can get my pointer, let's see. Right, so here on the upper left, uh, this is the Honduran white bat. Um, just an incredibly adorable little guy. Um, down here on the left, this is the, the tiniest bat in the world. This is the bumblebee bat. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a creature from, from Thailand and that part of the world. Uh, it's small enough to fit on your finger. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have bats like the Malaysian flying fox with a wingspan of, of four feet, right? So you can see this incredible uh, diversity of these, of these creatures. Um, and, and not only the diversity, but the adaptations that these bats have. I mean, if you look at some of these pictures um, here uh, on the upper left, again, we have uh, a, a Townsend's big-eared bat, right? And you aptly named, of course. Um, down here, we've got this, uh, this sword-nosed bat, and again, aptly named, right? And so all of these adaptations, these large ears and these large nose protru protrusions, these are all things that are associated with them uh, allowing them to echolocate, uh, to, to find their prey in the dark, right, so that they can be voracious predators of nocturnal insects. Um, we also have bats that, you know, have long tongues, just like hummingbirds, because they're nectar feeding bats or fruit eating bats. Um, you know, we do have vampire bats, three species of them uh, in South America. Uh, no, they generally don't go after humans. But the idea here is that, you know, these, these adaptations and this incredible diversity allows bats to exploit multiple ecosystems and allow them, allows them really to perform multiple functions in these different ecosystems. And all of those functions have a purpose for us. They have a benefit to humans, right, in, in the idea of um, provisioning ecosystem services. So here I've just compiled a few of uh, the more recent um, titles in the peer-reviewed literature that just, that just kind of show you the breadth of ecosystem services that, that bats provide humans. Um, who drinks tequila? Uh, bats are the main pollinator of the agave uh, plant, right? And um, without bats, no tequila. Um, again, insectivorous bats eat just about every type of arthropod you can imagine. They eat stink bugs, they eat mosquitoes, um, we're actually testing now to see if they eat spotted lanternfly. I'm sure you've all heard of, of that new invasive pest. Um, so they, they can provide, um, you know, significant uh, ecosystem and economic benefits to the agricultural industry. They reduce mosquito-borne illnesses by consuming insects, right? So they're um, increasing public health 
on that front. Um, so again, lots and lots and lots of, of different ecosystem services and, and benefits to humans. Unfortunately, um, just as we're really beginning to, um, to embrace this idea and to understand the true importance of bats, um, they're dying at alarming rates. And there's multiple reasons for this. Um, one is, is habitat loss. Uh, there's, there's still persecution across the globe of bats. Um, there's, there's a lot of bats that we actually don't know much about in general. And so we don't know what their population status is, but we can assume that they are um, under threat by a, a myriad of, of, of different factors. Here in, in North America, um, another major emerging threat is wind energy development, where bats um, are either collide with wind turbines or they, um, they actually basically have heart attacks as they're coming close to it because of the change in, in, in pressure and in air pressure. Um, but those are not things that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, the one that I'm focused on, the, the biggest threat here uh, in North America is white nose syndrome. Um, and, and this is, so I mentioned earlier that bats are uh, particularly good at carrying viral pathogens. Uh, so those are intracellular, right? Because they have these cellular repair uh, pathways. They are not so good at carrying fungal pathogens. Um, so extracellular. And the reason is, is because um, bats uh, and their wing membranes, right? It's, it's all skin, they just have a few layers of skin there and their wings are so important for so many physiological functions, whether it's cardiovascular systems or water loss, uh, um, water exchange and those, those sorts of things. And so when wings get infected as most of the time a fungal infection is, is via the skin, then they're in a lot of trouble. So white nose syndrome uh, is caused by an invasive fungal pathogen. The, the pathogen is called Pseudogymnoascus destructans. Uh, it's a mouthful, so you may uh, hear me refer to it as PD uh, for the rest of the talk. Um, but it, it's invasive. So uh, this fungus um, we've now learned is endemic to Europe and Asia. And bats there seem to have co-evolved with this pathogen. So they do get white nose syndrome, but they don't get it the infection is not severe enough to cause, cause mortality. Here in the United States and North America, the, the disease was first introduced um, in 2006. Um, we think that basically it was, it was brought over by uh, maybe on contaminated caving gear, recreational cavers coming over, um, coming into Albany, New York. And so you can see this, this picture here I have on, on the upper left. They call it white nose syndrome because of the characteristic um, white nose and muzzle, which is uh, the, the fungal hyphae basically growing out of the nose. We don't see this so much anymore, but in the beginning, uh, this is what you saw. Um, and so when this first came, um, came about, bats started to die in, in mass numbers. There was a mass mortality event. So if you can imagine hibernating bats um, in, in colonies up to tens of thousands of bats, and then you think about declines of up to 95% in certain uh, hibernation sites. What, what researchers saw when they went in to survey bats was something similar to this picture on the lower left, uh, which is basically just carpets of dead bats falling, falling off of the cave walls and, and just, uh, just laying on the ground. It was uh, devastating and it, it, it continues to be devastating. It's a multi-host pathogen, uh, so it, it, it infects multiple species um, as it has uh, as, as it has expanded westward and northward um, across North America, it's now confirmed in 12 North American species, um, eight species of which have, um, are, are those that actually get white nose syndrome. So there are, are some that they've detected the, the pathogen on them, but they don't actually get sick. And then others, um, which we'll talk about, uh, cause some population declines. Um, it's transmitted bat to bat and through environmental reservoirs. So basically bats, they go into hibernation, they slow down their immune system um, because they're going into a, a, what we call a torpid state. So they're in a hibernation of deep sleep. Um, the fungus grows on them. And then when they wake up um, or they get agitated, so they wake up more frequently from torpor. Um, so basically they, instead of every three weeks, they wake up to kind of groom and switch locations within a, a, a hibernation site they wake up much more frequently. When they do that, they deplete their fat reserves prematurely and so they can starve to death 
or there's a, um, a dehydration problem so that they, they have too much evaporative water loss, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, individuals that do clear infection can, can exit in the spring and go off and usually uh, survive if they make it through the hibernation period. But again, because this fungus um, is in the environment and can stay in those hibernation sites, even in the absence of bats, the bats return the following uh, late summer, early fall to go back into hibernation, they get reinfected and the cycle continues again. So there could be some long-term effects as well. Um, I'm going to show you this picture on, on the bottom here. So this is, um, this is an, uh, an early on picture from uh, early in the, the disease phase um, when white nose first came to North America. And so you can see these lesions on the wings. And again, it's a fungal pathogen. It, it, it invades the skin. Um, it disrupts all kinds of, again, physiological functions. And then what happens also is that there's this... Um, it's, it's an inflammatory response. So bats, when they, again, when they wake up from their, their torpid state and they restart their immune system, then inflammation happens. And you see this type of uh, Swiss cheese look on the wings. And of course, a bat with Swiss cheese wings can't fly and a bat that can't fly can't eat. Um, and so again, they can die as well. And so um, white nose syndrome has been here for, um, over a decade now, and, and we've learned quite a bit from since the beginning. Um, but this is a good summary um, from a paper that was just published this past year, showing you um, the percent change in, in, in population status, um, or in population, yeah, in population status or abundance um, after white nose syndrome arrival. And these are just different species of bats. Uh, so Aptezagus fuscus is a big brown bat. That's a very common bat. We still have them around. Um, gray bats, um, small footed bats. And then here in particular, the one I'm going to be looking at mostly is Myotis lucivagus um, or the little brown bat. So little brown bats um, were once the most common bat species in North America. And as you can see, uh, so the dotted line here represents zero impact of white nose syndrome. And then you can see the percent change in abundance is, is very, very close to minus 100, right? So we've had declines um, of up to 95, 96% in some hibernating colonies. So again, I'll be focusing on, on Myotis lucivagus. Okay, so here what I'm showing you um, is, is from another paper. So here's our, our little brown bat. And here again, um, this, is, this is Aeolus Cave. This was the first winter. Uh, that white nose syndrome hit Vermont in the winter of 2008, 2009. And again, researchers went in and this is what they saw. What I'm showing you here on the left are just colony counts of little brown bats. Um, so multiple hibernation sites. So each line represents um, a hibernation site and I have them sorted by large hibernation sites. So upwards of 5,000 hibernating individuals and then I have smaller colonies, right? And so what you see um, is, you know, back in time, 1985, up through the early 2000s, you can see that generally speaking, bats were doing okay, right? Little browns were, were growing um, in abundance, right? Probably due to a lot of, of other conservation actions that were happening. And then the gray bar or the gray shading indicates the emergence of white nose syndrome. And as you can see, the lines um, take a, a turn for the worse and all start plummeting down. Across all hibernating colonies, there were 73% declines uh, for little brown bats. And um, there were some population viability analyses done early on. And they predicted that, that little browns would go extinct, at least in this region, um, where white nose syndrome was, was um, affecting things within about 16 years, right? So a grim a grim picture for little brown bats. Uh, interestingly, um, no one was really doing uh, actual survival analyses for bats, um, for little browns. And part of it because it's, is because it's a difficult thing to do, but we initiated um, a marker capture study uh, to look at survival in the aftermath of white nose syndrome. So a marker capture study is, is one way of, of studying uh, populations. You can, you can calculate abundance that way. You can calculate survival. And so basically, 
Um, we went into Hibernia Mine, um, which is in Morris County here in New Jersey. And uh, this is a picture of Hibernia Mine. It's, it's an old iron mine tunnel. And what we did was we would go in there every uh, March. So just prior to spring emergence, and we would capture bats. Uh, this is a picture of, of my, my lab manager. This is Kathleen Kerwin. She's got a, a pile of bats in her hand. Um, and if you can see in this picture, but up here, definitely, we would put a small metal band. Uh, it's not a band, it's more of a cuff on the forearm of each bat that we caught. And then we could go in there subsequent years and uh, you know, recapture individuals, mark their, their ID number down, right? Because now we can identify individuals. And then we can go through uh, a statistical process uh, to look at the probability um, that bats would survive each year. And so what we found was some, some pretty interesting stuff and, and somewhat surprising results and somewhat promising results. Um, so what I'm showing you here, I know there's a lot of graphs here, um, but we'll start with the one on the left. So, um, and again, I'm, I'm not showing you all of the analytical processes, I'm just giving you the results. But so white nose syndrome came to New Jersey in the winter of 2000, uh, 2009, 2010. And again, we didn't have this study going, but we would estimate survival at about 22%. Um, in the year immediately following that, so in 2010, what you see here is that there's a marked rebound in survival, right? So 22% survival. So this is a probability scale. So it's, it's bounded, right, zero to one. Um, so my red pointer here is showing you where the immediate white nose syndrome survival was. And then you can see in 2010, um, and this is for males and females, but it goes up to somewhere about 65% survival. And I know you can't, it's, it's difficult to see, but we did detect a very, very slight, very slight, about 1% per year, increasing trend in survival with years since white nose syndrome arrival. Okay, so what that suggested to us was that, okay, there was an initial mass mortality event, but then there was a rebound. And so individuals are, are okay. So maybe they're tolerating the disease or maybe there is some type of resistance. We don't really know, but let's see. So what does this mean for the population? So we took those numbers and we look at some other numbers, reproduction rates, um, general longevity rates, uh, how many bats do individuals have per year? So fecundity and it's, it's one bat per year. And we did some population modeling. And what we said was, okay, um, we see that the population growth rate is lambda, lambda is our population growth rate of 0.95. So what that means is that um, basically every year then is um, the, the population in year two is 95% of, it what, of what it was in year one, right? So, or a decline of 5% per year. So it's still a decline, right? We're declining at 5% per year, but 5% per, per year is a lot better than what we saw in the previous graph and the previous prediction of regional extirpation within 16 years, right? So the picture is still bleak, but it's not as bleak. Uh, here, I'm just showing you what the population would be looking at, looking like. If you started with 1,000 individuals at 5% per year decline, this is the type of trend that you would see. Okay, so that was the first few years after white nose syndrome. And again, I'm going back to this uh, review paper that was just published uh, last year, in, or this year in 2021. And so now what I'm showing you um, is the annual population growth rate. So again, we're looking at that lambda. So a, a growth, a lambda of one means the population doesn't change from year to year. Anything above one means it's increasing and anything below one means it's decreasing. So what you can see is, is by and large, with the exception of this yellow line, which is um, the Northern long-eared bat who has plummeted um, quite low. And, and that's a, a story for another time. But by and large, the rest of the species are doing okay, right? They've, they've stabilized. And in some cases, they've, they've come back above one, right? We're looking at M. lucivagus again, right? Little browns. So you can see the orange line and it kind of, you know, dips down at white nose, uh, at year zero of white nose emergence, comes down to a low point, and then it starts to increase. And here we are above the lambda of one. And so again, we're, we're back to positive population growth. So this is a good thing, right? So 
our results um, from the previous slide were somewhere around here, and now we've continued to increase. So this is good news, right? And I'm gonna point you again to this U-shaped curve because this becomes important in, in a minute. Okay, so <clears throat> we see this U-shaped curve. We see this return to positive growth or at least to stability. So what is causing that? Um, there's multiple factors that, that could uh, get at this. One is that the pathogen is evolving to be less virulent. Um, and, and we see that a lot in nature, right? If you're a virus, you don't want to kill off your host too quickly. So as you um, go through time, you evolve to become less virulent, right? So you can infect more individuals and they can infect more individuals and you can maintain your longevity as a virus. It could be that the bats themselves are changing their behavior. Um, maybe they're not roosting together and, right, and increasing transmission, right? Maybe they're reducing by changing their behavior. Maybe they're hibernating in a colder area or a drier area, places that the, that the uh, fungus doesn't grow as well. It could be adaptive immunity. It could be innate immunity, some kind of immune response, right? Um, you know, we think about uh, T cells. I'm sure people know a lot about that now with COVID-19, right? So you're infected with something, uh, your body now can recognize it the next time it comes in, and so it can fight it off a lot better. So maybe it's some kind of immune response. Or maybe there's some type of rapid evolution going on. And this is the question that we're particularly interested in, um, not just for bats. I mean, I study bats, but um, rapid evolution of populations now is, is a very big question because anthropogenic change, right, human-caused changes, they're changing the environment so rapidly that if populations cannot evolve quickly enough to withstand those changes, then those populations are in, in deep trouble. And so this is a big question in science, is, is how do populations respond to these abrupt environmental changes? So I'll be talking about the, the rapid evolution component um, for the rest of the talk. All right, so in particular, uh, there's this concept of evolutionary rescue. So um, evolutionary rescue, basically what it means is that if you think about um, time zero, right? Before white nose syndrome, you have a bunch of bats all happily existing, right? And, and most of them, if you look at this graph, right? Here's frequency and here's genotypes, right? So they have some genetic makeup and they all probably have something very similar to each other, right? So you have this bell-shaped curve. You have a lot of bats that are really good at, at this environment. Okay, abrupt environmental change happens, disease, white nose syndrome. What happens? Well, if these guys are not fit against that disease, then you're going to, they're gonna die, right? And so let's drop down to this graph and you're gonna see this steep demographic decline, right? Population is gonna crash. So then what's important here are the tails of this distribution of genotypes. What kind of rare genotypes do we have in a population, either over here or over here? If these guys, if there's anybody over here that is resistant, right, that can survive this, this change or this disease, if they can survive long enough and reproduce fast enough, then they can rescue the population from that demographic decline right here and then cause this U-shaped curve, right? Evolutionary rescue, and then continue the population growth on a positive trajectory. Now, again, we don't normally think of evolutionary rescue as something that's relevant to conservation because usually mutations have to happen and that takes too much time. It, it, that, that, that happens over evolutionary time, not over um, ecological time, but we're seeing it more and more. So, we modeled, we, we took a mathematical approach and we said, okay, for little brown bats, what would it look like if the population was undergoing some type of evolutionary rescue? And again, I'm, I'm sparing you all the math, um, but basically what we said was, okay, let's simplify it. We have two types of bats. We have the wild type bats, right? So that's the ones that were fine, doing great, well represented um, prior, so that's the blue, prior to white nose syndrome. Okay, and then you don't see the line, but let's just say there's, there's very few robust individuals, right, and, or resistant individuals. Okay, white nose syndrome happens, so you would see this demographic decline, and, and right, what you would see is that you, you ultimately are losing blue 
bats and you're starting to see more and more gray bats, more and more robust bats. And what's happening? Well, basically the, the burden of population growth is shifting away from the wild types, the unresistant individuals in favor of these robust individuals, right? And again, so you see this U-shaped curve somewhere around here, the population is at the most vulnerable, but if survival and reproduction can happen, then here's our U-shaped curve. And then we, we, we project that out. We projected it out also to look at lambda, okay? And so you would see the same thing here. Um, and again, lambda of one means that the population is not growing at all. Uh, it's, it's just stable. So here, right, you would see the, the U-shape, right? The, the population growth decline, decline, decline. And then ultimately it comes just above uh, lambda of one. And so then we, can, we would see an increase of somewhere around 5% per year. So we said, that's what it would look like. <coughs> Let's go back to our marker capture study. We continued that for several more years. Um, these graphs here on the left are from another paper that was published uh, showing you little brown bat populations. So the red line is showing you uh, colony counts from minus five is before, so years since PD detection. So before white nose syndrome and then white nose syndrome, right? And then again, we see a U-shaped curve in New York Another one here, New York, different regions of New York. Virginia is having a, a, its own issue here. Um, and New Jersey, you can see high population crash and then some stabilization, right? So New Jersey, we're, our marker capture study is represented in this New Jersey count. So let's go back to this graph here, our survival probability. And what I'm showing you here now is a continuation. We, we added a few more years of analyses. And so we still see this increasing trend in survival. Uh, we ended this, um, this study in 2016, and we had a survival probability now for males and females of, of just under 0.8, right? So a survival rate of just under 80%, 75 to 80%. And that actually uh, meets the 10-year pre-white nose average, okay? So they were surviving at that rate, white nose syndrome came, bad, 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 and then they rebounded, and now they've increased, and they've gotten back to that average. Um, we then took these survival estimates and we projected them out to calculate our, our data-based lambda, right? And so our model-based was 1.05. Our data-based, our empirical lambda is 1.03, so pretty close uh, to each other, All right? So again, um, we're interested in whether or not this is evolutionary rescue or some type of, of selection, right? And so how do we know that something is rapid evolution or not, right? And so I just want to go through a couple terms here. Um, so we'll start with a bottleneck, and I, I'm sure most of you know what a, a bottleneck is, right? And so here, uh, these dots here, these colored dots represent our, our population, and each color represents some individual, some genotype, all right? So you have a, a nice mix in there. And then the, the dotted line represents our change, right? Or our disease, okay? So something happens, um, lots of individuals die off, and here's what we're left with in a bottleneck. A bottleneck is random, right? So just by chance, these two red guys and this little blue guy made it through the bottleneck. So this now is our ending genetic diversity. That's not evolution, that's just chance. All right, um, selection happens via two pathways. One is a hard selective sweep, and that's something where um, you have, uh, so here we have our, our, um, our event, right? Our, our, our bottleneck event. The X represents a, a new mutation that then rapidly um, fix, gets fixed through the population. So everybody after this mutation becomes blue. That's a hard selective sweep. Um, those are things that you can detect more easily um, looking at genetics and genomics. Soft selective sweeps, on the other hand, are, are um, instead of just one mutation or one change, you have multiple changes happening, right? So multiple um, loci or mul multiple genes of, of small effect um, are all changing and moving in, in the same direction. Um, you, you can have this either via mutation. So again, you have your bottleneck event and then you have these mutations, 
But again, on the conservation scale, this doesn't really happen, um, or it's not gonna happen fast enough. So what we're interested in is mutations that happened before that, and now we're looking at standing genetic variation, right? So the bottleneck happens and then whoever's left, if they have uh, the right genetic makeup, can they, can that then be fixed in the population? So that's what we're looking for. All right, so <clears throat> the best way that we can see to do this is to sample populations um, from before an event and then sample that same population after an event. And that's exactly what we did with little brown bats. So uh, I'm gonna talk mostly about um, these two sites here, Hibernia, again, in New Jersey, and then Walter Williams Preserve in New York. Okay, so the yellow and red lines. So over here, we've got the population counts, right? So again, this you've seen this. Uh, New Jersey population goes down uh, and stays there. New York's population goes down and then kind of has that uptick U-shaped trajectory. So what we did was we um, collected specimens that, were, that died in that first mass mortality event when white nose first hit those two respective mines. Um, so we, we took those specimens and then we went back in to these two sites 10 years later and we collected samples from them. And when I say collected samples, we take a two millimeter wing punch. We take a little biopsy punch, we catch the bat, we spread their wing out and we collect this, this tiny little piece of skin. So it's non-invasive and then we send them back on their merry way. Um, so we did that. Um, so now we, can, we have two, two colonies um, of pre and post white nose syndrome tissue from the same sites. All right, um, again, we, I'm gonna spare you the details, but we, we used an approach called low coverage whole genome sequencing. So this is relatively novel at the time, um, but basically we take our, our little two millimeter wing punch, we extract the DNA from it, um, we prepare our, our DNA libraries, and then we, we sequence these things um, using, uh, we, we try to sequence the whole genome. In reality, you don't sequence the whole genome. You, we've got about 50% of the genome, um, but the, the genome is about, oh, well, I don't know, 2 million base pairs. So it's, it's, it's pretty large. Um, and what you do is you get low coverage. So what that means is that you're getting, um, you're not getting multiple copies across the genome. You're only getting a, a few copies of each, uh, of each section. And so then you have to do a few statistical analyses to kind of look at what's called a genotype likelihood. So there's just a little statistics involved in there. But by and large, you get much more uh, coverage of, of, the, of the genome. You, you're sequencing more of the genome than previous approaches. So you can see more of what's happening. Okay, well, what are we looking for? Well, um, we're looking for sing changes in single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. All right, so just a little um, quick genetic lesson here, right? So um, let's say we have two individuals here in our population, right? And so uh, DNA is double-stranded. And so, right, we have our, our A's, our C's, our, 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 our A's, our T's, our C's, our G's, right? And so here, um, the GC on, on either side here, right, that's conserved in both of these individuals in the population. But the one in the middle, this guy has a GC, and this guy down here has an AT. So that is a single nucleotide polymorphism, a difference, okay? So it's variation in the genotypes between these two individuals. So this is what we're looking for in the population. What we wanna know is what did it look like before white nose syndrome happened? And then did any of these, you know, where did these SNPs change significantly in frequency in the population as a result, putatively, um, of white nose syndrome? All right, so um, that can happen again by chance via just that bottleneck effect. So we did some analyses to look at SNPs that change significantly, more, signific more significantly than would be expected by chance. Okay, and so um, ultimately we found almost 10,000 SNPs uh, that, were, that changed in allele frequency. And so they were either associated with survival of white nose or um, mortality of white nose syndrome. Um, we took a conservative approach because we wanted to make sure that we were really only looking at things um, we, 
that we could really say something about. And so uh, we went through several filters and basically we en ended up with 63 candidate SNPs that changed in frequency of, of over 50% between the pre-white nose population and the post-white nose population. Um, and so these graphs are just kind of um, indicating that these, these green dots up here are showing you uh, those SNPs that changed um, significantly. Down here on, on panel C and D, um, these are showing you allele frequencies in each, um, in each of the mines. Um, so again, I wanna look mostly at the yellow and red lines because that's the, the Walter Williams Preserve and the Hibernia mine. Um, and basically um, the dotted lines are showing you a, a, a model of, of genetic drift or again, just that bottleneck. So the random, the random shifting of allele frequencies by chance. All right, but what we see here, what I'm showing you in this graph is that, okay, in the non-survivors, um, right, you have these, these SNPs or these alleles that they're occurring in low to moderate frequency, right? So either very close to zero or, you know, about half, uh, 0.5, right? But then in the survivors, you can see that both for Williams and Hibernia, those, the allele frequencies shifted. And in, and in some cases, some of those SNPs were fixed in the post white nose populations. That means all survivors had those SNPs. Okay, so then we can feel pretty confident that those, that standing genetic variation was the target of rapid natural selection. Okay, so what does it all mean? Well, the next thing we need to do is say, okay, well, well what do these SNPs do, right? SNPs are located within genes. So some of these genes are annotated. That means they're described, we know what their function is to some degree. Maybe not in bats, but we know what they do in humans or they, we know what they do in some other hibernating animal. So interestingly, um, only one of the, the genes um, in which a SNP was found was associated with immunity. So it's interesting because you think about a disease, right? And the, your immediate thought is, well, it must be, selection must be acting on immunity in some way. And so, but we only found one. Um, and and this, this MASP1, um, it, it, it has to do with um, the, the component C3, which is, is basically a, a protein that destroys microbes, right? So that makes sense if you're going to come in there and start destroying things. Um, but I think coupled with this were other papers that were published that said, you know, um, they looked at, at bats that were infected and they said, okay, what, what does the antibody production look like? Um, antibody production, right? So an immune response doesn't prevent mortality. So it, it's, it kind of um, pairs nicely with, with some of those other papers that say immune, immune function really isn't, isn't helping them any. In, in fact, in a lot of cases, it's hurting them. Hey, Brooke, if I could yeah. just interject uh, just another few minutes. Sure. I'm over to Q&A. Yep. So um, we looked at some other uh, genes that were under selection, and we found basically that what we think is happening is that selection is acting on hibernation behavior itself. So um, Bats are, they go into hibernation, they go into that torpor, torpid state. And again, they awake from torpor on these regular cycles normally, but um, white nose syndrome makes them go uh, awake more frequently. And then of course, starvation and things like that. So we have this sleepy bat hypothesis, which is that bats that were in the population that went into a deeper torpor state didn't wake up as frequently as the other bats. And that allowed them to then withstand white nose syndrome infection, right? They would awake a few, a little bit more frequently, but not enough to kill them. So our sleepy bat hypothesis. The other thing that we think happened were with, was with genes that uh, have to do with metabolism. So um, we call this one the fat bat hypothesis. And, and we saw that when bats come back to the hibernation period, right? They have to uh, fatten up for the winter, right? Just like bears or some other hibernating individual. And so what, we're, what we see is that maybe bats, uh, their, their hormone regulations, things that, that control their appetite, their level of, of satiation, right? Um, those genes are being expressed in a way that allows them to eat more. And so um, again, fat bat hypothesis. And so now the next step for us is to look at those um, hypotheses and, and now test them out, right? So let's link the genotype that we see, those genes to the phenotype, to the actual hibernation strategy. 
And so we are conducting a series of tests to look at exactly that. Um, we're looking at, at, first of all, are the genes that we've seen being expressed differently in individuals with and without these target SNPs, right? These resistant SNPs. Um, the second thing we're looking at is, do, the, do those torpor patterns actually change? Are they different? So we, we're putting on um, temperature sensitive transmitters on these bats in hibernation and we're able to genotype them. And then we can look and see if there's differences in the torpor patterns. And then finally, we're, we're doing some blood and adipose tests, uh, fat tests, to see if we can quantify the level of hormones of these different appetite hormones, we call them, to see what's going on and if these physiological changes are actually leading to survival. Uh, so with that, I, uh, I will finish up and um, I think I'll take any questions. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, you can stop sharing your screen now if you'd like. Okay. Uh, hold on. There we go. There you go. So we do have a few questions. Um, you had talked a little bit earlier about um, what bats do for the ecology, sort of like the agave, and they eat mosquitoes and, and they prevent some of those diseases. Any other, um, so the question was, why are bats so important that we should be concerned about this disease? Are there any other things that, um, that bats do for us that uh, you go into greater detail on? Sure, yeah, so I mean, I mentioned the, the tequila because that's, that's a, it's, it's always nice to drink tequila, I guess. But um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, bats eat uh, lots and lots and lots of insects. And, uh, you know, we just actually published a, um, a paper that said that um, we looked at a, basically a seasonal uh, dietary analysis. And we found that the bats were eating over 160 different uh, species of known agricultural pest or disease vector. Um, there's other papers that look and say, okay, you know, not only are they just eating them in the environment, but they actually are tracking the eruptions and the outbreaks of, of these insects, right? So, you know, you have a, a, an outbreak of stink bugs and the bats all come in and start eating them. And so they can, at least we can't quantify it just yet. We don't have the tools, but what we think is that they can actually suppress or regulate those insect populations. And, and there's been some papers published to estimate that bats, um, it's already, it's already outdated, but that they're worth on average about uh, $23 billion to the U.S. agricultural industry just in insect pest suppression. Wow. Uh, yeah, pollination is, is another huge one. Seed dispersal in, in certain other locations, not so much here, um, but for us in our region, it's, it's insectivory uh, and, and all of the, the benefits that come along with that. Okay, uh, another question. Are there significant differences in the hibernating slash metabolic behavior between different age classes of bats that affect WNS survival uh, between European or North American bats? Um, between different age group age groups, no, not that we can really. Um, nothing that we uh, think is significantly affecting. Uh, disease severity or infection severity. Here, we, we pretty much think that it's um, the pathogen load leads to the infection severity. Um, so basically, in North America, we know that the, the loads of fungal spores within the hibernacula, um, in, in, so in Europe, you know, you have some, you have some baseline load, and then it does um, progress throughout the winter and then it peaks at late winter just prior to the spring emergence. We see the same thing here, except that in the summertime, um, the, the, the PD loads in our hibernacula are much more elevated uh, relative to Europe. And so when, when you look at our bats and you look at European bats or Asian bats and you look at where the plateau is in PD load, um, you see that our our asymptote at that peak is much higher than the asymptote in European bats. Okay. Uh, if you have little brown bats around your house, is there something you can do to help the bats survive? Or what should you do? 
Yeah, um, I mean, you know, right now it's when, so when they leave hibernation uh, for the spring, the bats are actually, the females are already pregnant. They, uh, they mate in the fall and then there's a delayed implantation. So, uh, you know, they, they store the sperm and then they go into hibernation and then in the spring, that's when implantation happens. So if you have, you know, putting up um, bat houses, um, you know, and again, there's not too many little browns left, but if you have little browns, then you can certainly uh, add some additional habitat. There's, uh, you know, you can do heated bat boxes, which helps the females to maintain warmth, especially in April when, um, you know, it, it can be cold, it can be rainy, there's not a lot of insects out, that sort of thing. Um, but by and large, I would say the biggest thing that people can do is that, you know, bats, um, bats like man-made structures, little browns, big browns, um, they like structures and they can certainly roost, you know, either in the house or outside underneath the shutters or underneath the, the, the fascia board or the trim. And so, you know, not disturbing them or if they're in your house having uh, uh, an, an eviction done, but then putting up alternative habitat like a bat house, um, that's something that, that can help minimize um, the disturbance to them if you're, if you're evicting them. Okay. Um, can people get infected by bats with this disease? With white nose syndrome? No. No, white nose syndrome uh, does not affect humans. Um, but I, I think I'll add another um, point to that. With, so with COVID-19, you know, one of the things that we were concerned about was, you know, bats carry coronaviruses. Um, North American bats, right, there's, there's, there's alpha coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses. North American bats do not carry beta coronaviruses, which are the viruses that cause the SARS-like uh, infections. And so we were actually concerned, not that, that the bats were going to give us COVID-19, but that we were going to inf be infected and give them COVID-19 COVID or some other form of it um, and introduce beta coronaviruses to our bats. They've done some tests uh, where they actually tried to infect bats with COVID, with SARS-CoV-2 and, and it didn't take, uh, which, is, which is good news. But no, we, we cannot get white nose syndrome. Um, how did you become interested in bats? Did you have to overcome any fear? Uh, no, I didn't have to overcome any fear. Um, how did I get interested in bats? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I, I put up a bat house at my house. Um, I, I did my PhD on shorebirds, um, and I still work with shorebirds on coastal systems. But yeah, I put up a bat house, and I, I got some some occupants, and it just became fascinating to me. Uh, and then I had the opportunity to get involved in some white nose projects, um, and I, I just sort of became enveloped in the whole problem solving process. Um, you know, bats are incredibly intelligent. They're incredibly gregarious. They're uh, they're they don't try to attack you. They don't. I mean, I go into caves and mines where there are still quite a few bats and I'm walking and they're all around me and they don't touch me. I can, I can feel the breeze of their wing as they pass by, but I'm not concerned at all that they're going to touch me. And when we catch them, of course, we wear gloves uh, just in case. And when you catch a bat, um, they're not happy as most animals, <laughs> animals aren't. Um, but no, I, I, I didn't have to overcome any, anything. Okay. Um, you had mentioned in your presentation that certain species are infected with this disease. Um, presumably other species are not. Is it because the other species are impervious or it just hasn't reached those populations yet, the uh, WNS? Yeah, I, so it's a bit of both. Um, so white nose is, uh, is a disease of hibernating bats. There are bats that um, do not hibernate in caves and mines. Um, they're migratory species. Uh, so other bats we have, for example, in New Jersey are red bats, hoary bats, um, silver-haired bats. Those are migratory bats. And so they don't, while they will go into a torpid state for you know, days at a time, um, A, they're not going into the caves where they have these huge environmental reservoirs. And B, if they do get it on them, maybe bat to bat or however they get it, 
um, they're not staying in that torpid state long enough to allow the infection to really take hold. They, they wake up, they become what we say euthermic, so that they, they, everything jump starts again. And then they, they just groom it off and nothing, nothing happens to them. So we say that they can be PD positive, but not white nose syndrome positive. The other bats, you know, it's still going west. It's still moving west. And we are concerned. There's quite a few other um, hibernating species out there that we're, we're just waiting. It's going to be there. It'll get there. Great. Thanks, Brooke. Those are the questions that we had.